Hello, my name is Neil Ferguson. I'm the Milbank Family Senior Fellow at the Hoover Institution at Stanford, and I chair the Hoover History Working Group. Uh, this week, uh, we've had the pleasure of hearing Jennifer Burns, a professor at the Stanford History Department, talking about her forthcoming biography of Milton Friedman, one of the most famous of uh, Hoover Fellows, indeed one of the most famous economists of the 20th century. And uh, I thought I'd begin, Jennifer, by asking you to, to put in context uh, the chapter that you presented to the working group, which was entitled The Age of Monetarism, uh, a chapter that discusses Friedman's political engagement in both the United Kingdom and the United States uh, in the 1980s. Uh, so it's a chapter relatively late in uh, his biography. How does it fit into the, the narrative arc of the life of Friedman as you're telling it? Yeah, um, good morning, Neil. Thanks for that question. So it's a curious chapter because it is one of the last ones and it finds Friedman um, very active um, in the public realm in the political realm, but not as active in the realm of academic economics, which was really his uh, wheelhouse for most of his life. At the same time, although he's no longer producing, assembling ideas, researching full time, his ideas about money, his ideas about monetarism are being discussed all over the world. So it's really a paradoxical moment for him when um, he finds his ideas more popular, more widely known than ever, but He's also feeling frustrated. Um, he gives a talk midway through this period in 1984, how to give monetarism a bad name. So he feels like he's losing control of his ideas a bit, um, although they're also as influential as they've ever been. And in terms of the, the chapter and sort of how I put it together, the lens is opening out um, away from Friedman the individual and more to Friedman um, the source of ideas and Friedman the icon and Friedman the symbol. He'd achieved the ultimate uh, prize for an economist uh, in winning the Nobel Prize. Uh, and uh, he also then moved uh, from Chicago to the Hoover Institution. Tell us a little bit about about those two events in his life and, and what their significance was for him. Did, did winning the Nobel give him permission to focus on politics as it has done to some other economists I can think of? Um, not, not so much. I mean, I don't think it was a rapid change in his public profile. His, his, he really became publicly known in the Goldwater campaign of 1964 and after. And then he had a Newsweek column starting in the mid 60s. So it didn't change his public profile or draw the media to him in the way it would have with a, an economist who was more obscure. Um, I think if you asked him, he might say even more than the Nobel, of course, there's no gain saying what a great honor that was, was the fact that he had made some very um, unusual predictions about what would happen in the economy, some very strong predictions about inflation, and the fact that they um, came true, the things he had said would happen in the 1970s happened over time. I think he would probably be more proud of that because that for him was the ultimate test of scientific validity, of a theory that it could predict what would happen in the real world. So, um, you know, it, it, the Nobel is incredible, but I think he would have been equally proud of the fact that he went out on a limb to make some predictions and his ideas about how money would work in the economy, what would happen with inflation were really borne out. Um, so then he gets the Nobel, it's 1976, and he's coming to the end of his time as an active faculty member at the University of Chicago. And he had actually thought about coming to Stanford earlier in his career, but he couldn't tear himself away from Chicago. By 1976, he's reaching retirement age, and he's also decided that he's not going to engage as fully in the academic disputes in the field of economics as he was, but he wants to still be um, you know, maybe not in academia, but of academia. He doesn't want to leave that behind. He's a thinker, he's an intellectual. So what Hoover offers him, it's, it's in a period of growing influence and growing development. Hoover started, um, you know, as, as, a, as a much smaller place than it is today known nationally. And so it's actually a great marriage because Friedman gets to come to Stanford. 
He gets to be part of the institution. He gets to, you know, guest lecture in his colleagues' classes. Um, at the same time, he gets connected to people like Ronald Reagan, um, people who will work in Reagan's administration, Margaret Thatcher. So he can kind of keep a foot in both worlds, his avocation of policy, as he said it, while still being connected to a great university. Um, so that will be, and then also I have to say his wife Rose was like, I've lived my whole life in Chicago for you. Please, I would like to go to the Bay Area. So he gets all the fruits of the Bay Area as well. Now, was it that connection that led to Margaret Thatcher? In the end, uh, Thatcherism starts a little bit before Reaganism. And so it's in fact in the UK that one starts to see monetarism in, in practice. Talk a little bit about Friedman's relationship to Thatcher and how he became, well, almost a household name in 1980s Britain. Yeah, it's really interesting. It starts a bit earlier in that as Friedman's talking about the dangers of inflation, um, he starts banging the drum about Britain um, in the 60s and early 70s, actually early 70s, saying, you know, you're really on a bad path. Um, things are not going to work out. And a lot of British politicians really, they're like, who's this American guy coming in and telling us we're on the road to perdition? So he, people start arguing about Friedman as sort of a proxy for these ideas about what should government policy be? Um, how worried should we be about inflation? How worried should we be about um, the different policies of labor government? Um, things like this. So he, he first becomes a, a sort of term of, of uh, uh, political disputation. At the same time, his ideas are going back to that famous 1967 address when he talks about the perils of inflation. They're starting to be read more widely in universities. They're starting to be read more widely among this sort of conservative party intelligentsia. And that's when Margaret Thatcher comes across his ideas. I wouldn't say that they profoundly shape her ideas and that they change the direction she's heading. I think they help reinforce um, the idea she already has. When she does become prime minister, she has several advisors who are um, very much monetarists, who have worked with Friedman or trained with him and are giving her sort of an independent stream of advice. Although monetarism remains controversial amongst the other ministers and the other departments of government that have responsibility for policy. It's sometimes argued that, that monetarism was a failure and yet, in terms of defeating inflation, surely it was a resounding success uh, in Britain and then uh, in the United States. How does your how does your book come down in that debate? Um, are are you are, are you of the view that ultimately monetarism didn't work, or was it actually a victim of its own success? It did work, but uh, got the blame for the pain of uh, getting rid of inflation? Yeah, I mean, I, I've puzzled a lot over that and it goes back to what are you meaning by monetarism? So on some definitions, control a defined monetary aggregate, that proved really hard to do in part because both in England and in Britain, there would be institutional changes, um, lending changes, uh, to, you know, interest on checking or savings deposits, those would change. And so your definition of what is money and what you're trying to target it's a moving target, very hard to do. So on, on a really narrow piece, the sort of tactical piece, it's hard to say that it worked and most central banks that tried it, um, at least the, 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 in Britain and the United States, they tried really hard and they eventually had to abandon. I like to kind of zoom out as a historian, take the 30,000 foot view and think, what were some of the bigger themes that Friedman talked about? Um, he talked about the importance of money. He talked about the uh, importance of consistent policy. Um, he talked about the fact that you couldn't perpetually trade off inflation and unemployment, that eventually you, you would end up with both. Um, and he talked about the importance of the central bank in regulating the money supply and the fact that sharp changes in the money supply, uh, whether up or down, were going to have macroeconomic consequences. And those were ideas that he brought into discussion. He really pushed, others picked up and elaborated, um, but they wouldn't have gotten started without him. The other piece that's really important, that's kind of a through line in his work is talking about expectations, that you have, um, you have policy and then you have what people expect policy will do. Uh, there's another branch of Chicago economics, rational expectations that took that farther, 
and, and put it into sort of formal mathematical terms. But a lot of what came out of monetarism was um, people are listening for cues. And if you're telling them uh, money is important, inflation is something to avoid, the central bank is assuming the task of holding down inflation and it's credible. Um, in other words, that it really seems like they mean it, that will create an expectation that inflation is not going to continue and that ex expectation that it's not going to continue actually helps it not continue. It's, it's almost, um, you can almost uh, uncreate it simply by the mental shift uh, among key economic actors, among the bond market, consumers, uh, unions, uh, corporations setting wages and prices. So Friedman became, going back to the way he was a symbol and, uh, and a theorist, um, it became, you could, by picking up Friedman, you could sort of symbolize we're really serious about this theory of defeating inflation, we're really gonna do it. And so you see that happening both in Britain and in the United States with Paul Volcker. Um, they both use Friedman as a thinker and they use him as a symbol. And um, over time, you know, inflation becomes much less of a problem. It's hard for us to remember today um, what a problem it was and how forefront it was in the minds of voters, politicians, policymakers throughout that time period, the late 70s into the 80s. In the UK, Milton Friedman was, of course, seen as an outsider. He was very much a part of uh, the American economics uh, profession, and he connected from there into the, the policy world. Uh, our old uh, late lamented friend George Schultz uh, always referred to him as, as Milton, an old friend. But one of the things you point out in the book is that his relationship with Paul Volcker was not so friendly. And I love to think of those two together as, as the odd couple of American monetary history, because I think Paul Volcker was literally twice the height of Milton Friedman. Tell us a bit about that relationship. Volcker gets a, a lot of the credit for having brought inflation under control uh, in his time at the Fed. Um, how did he think of, of Friedman? And talk a little bit about the relationship more generally between a policy maker, uh, a, a bureaucrat, and a, an academic, a professor. Yeah, so some of the tension in that relationship goes back a little bit earlier to Bretton Woods, um, which was the system, international system of currency management that set um, exchange rates. And uh, Paul Volcker came up in that system and believed in it deeply. And Milton Friedman thought it should be torn down and exchange rates should be left to float. And so there's a moment in the late 60s and 70s, early 70s, when this system is unraveling and Paul Volcker and the Treasury Department is trying to keep it together. And Milton Friedman is back channeling to George Shultz and Richard Nixon trying to tear it down. So you fast forward to the late 70s and Volcker's like, here comes this guy again, who's making my life difficult. At the same time, he's using some monetarist language. He's keeping up with the literature. Um, he's listening to Friedman. They write each other respectful letters, um, but he's worried because Friedman is just a critic out there. Friedman is bangs away at the Fed from the 50s on. I mean, nobody can do it right. And so I think for him, it's a bit of a frustration that he's in sort of inside the machine trying to balance political imperatives um, the technology and practices the Fed has, the Fed staff, his board, and then he's got Friedman, you know, who's sitting in his office, um, checking through data, you know, writing Newsweek columns saying he's doing it wrong. Um, so I think there's just some intrinsic tension between the view you have from the outside and the view you have from the inside. And over time, Friedman is able to soften a bit and say, He's very, very harsh on Volcker. He won't believe a thing Volcker says, um, especially during the first part of his tenure when he's trying to get the policy right and money's going up and money's going down. And over time he looks back and he says, yeah, I can see that um, some of that wasn't Volcker's fault. But he's really, he really begrudges the idea that Volcker defeats inflation. He's really, um, he's frustrated with that. And he feels that Volcker uses monetarism as a sort of veil to just jack up interest rates and that the policy is really about interest rates, not about money. So there's a, there's a technical dispute. And then there's also, I think Friedman feels his ideas are being misappropriated. And then Volcker becomes like a darling of the press. And so maybe there's a bit of resentment about that as well. Well, John Kenneth Galbraith, uh, who was no monetarist, uh, grudgingly acknowledged that the 
later years of the 20th century were the age of Milton Friedman. That's a quote you put right at the beginning of this chapter. It feels right now as if the age of Friedman ended some time ago. And uh, indeed, it's almost as if when one looks at monetary data, Friedman's uh, legacy has completely been forgotten. Uh, a final uh, obvious question, you're going to get asked it an awful lot after the book comes out. What would Milton Friedman think of, of what we're doing in 2021? Okay, that's a really interesting question. So one way to look at it is to think back to how did he respond to the Great Depression? Um, and what was really interesting for me to see was how he and all his colleagues and professors at the University of Chicago were like, this is an emergency. We have to do things differently because it's an emergency. So I think there was more flexibility and latitude in his thinking than the sort of caricature might assume. So I think thinking about coronavirus um, as an emergency, as not ordinary time, I think he would be thinking about policy in that framework, but he would also be very careful. It's an emergency, so don't change things um, in a way that persists beyond the emergency. Let's recalibrate when we're back. So we're somewhere in the middle of this. Um, I think that he would be uh, willing to spend more than usual to get through the emergency. I don't know how he would handle the, um, I think he would not like mask mandates, but I think he himself would be wearing a mask uh, without fail. Um, and I think he would be concerned that are we setting things in place that we can't unwind when this is over and that um, we need to keep in mind it's only temporary. Well, I very much hope you're right that uh, our current emergency is only temporary and indeed soon will be over. Uh, uh, Jennifer, you're in the home straight with this biography, and uh, I see before you uh, a future of copy editors' queries and other yes. such uh, torments, but uh, I wish you luck with the final phase of, uh, of writing this uh, monumental biography. Uh, and we look forward very much to its, uh, its publication. Thanks for coming and speaking to yes. the Hoover History Working Group. Thank you so much. It was my pleasure.